Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about balance and their various implementations by focusing on how exactly energy can be transferred within the component. Most balance rely either on magnetic field coupling or transmission line coupling. But there is an intermediate construction that does both. And if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. One common type of balon used in all sorts of circuits is the current balon. Usually it's built on a ferrite core, a material that can have useful magnetic properties into the tens or few hundred megahertz, but the balon itself can be built to work into the gigahertz range. I have this particular part around and its datasheet says it works up to 3 gigahertz. But even though the exact core material is not mentioned, I'm pretty sure the core is not capable of providing useful magnetic permeability at that frequency. So how does this thing work? By definition, a transformer works by transferring energy from one circuit to another using magnetic fields. A primary core creates a magnetic flux which is directed through a secondary coil using a magnetically permeable material. And at this second coil, the variable flux induces a voltage. Now transformers are a widely used component, but the main limitation of this operating principle is the non-ideal magnetic material, since this will not work at any frequency. In general, any magnetic material presents a frequency dependent complex magnetic permeability. Up until a certain point you have your real permeability, which behaves like an inductor, storing and releasing magnetic energy, and then at higher frequency you have your imaginary permeability, which takes the magnetic energy and turns it into heat. So for the application of a transformer, you want to be using the core in a region at relatively low frequency where the real permeability is far higher than the imaginary one. This way the energy that is being put into the core on the primary side can actually be transferred into the secondary rather than getting wasted as heat. So one magnetic core that I have around is built from the type 52 material from ferrite, which if we look through the datasheet, specifically at the permeability graph, we can see that it can be used as a efficient transformer up to about 2 or 3 megahertz, after which the imaginary permeability starts to kick in and most of the energy that you put into the core will get dissipated as heat. So let's see what sort of transformer we can build with such a core. To test this out, I prepared a one-to-one -one transformer with a clearly separated primary and secondary winding, and I'm measuring this using the light VNA connected directly to the computer. This way you can make more detailed measurements. So after finishing all of the calibrations on the VNA, we can start measuring the transformer. So to see its useful bandwidth. So here we can see a closer look of our transformer, so with the two windings completely separated one from the other, placed on the two opposing sides of the ferrite core. And well, when we measure this thing, specifically the S21 parameter, we can see that we have a peak response at around 250 kilohertz, and the exact value is minus 1.37 decibels. Now if we look for the minus 3 decibel point in reference to this thing, so to the left it's below the 100 kilohertz measurement point, but to the right, it's at around 1.1 megahertz, after which the response is all downhill. So this is not a great transformer, main reason being the exact construction, which has quite a bit of leakage flux, so the unshared magnetic flux. And of course, the core material itself, it's not supposed to be a good transformer anyway, above a few megahertz. So how can we make something better? Another important principle widely used in high frequency circuits is the transmission line coupling effect. When two conductors are in close proximity, they share a magnetic field because of the inductance of the two wires and an electric field because of the capacitance in between the two lines. So for this effect to be clearly visible, the exact length of coupled cable needs to be long enough so that it can be treated as a transmission line. In other words, the electrical length 
needs to be some part of the wavelength of the transmitted signal. Usually a minimum of 0.1 wavelengths is specified. So at very low frequencies, there will be no visible coupling, but this changes and becomes more and more obvious as frequency increases. Now as long as all of the impedances are matched, so the signal source's output impedance, the characteristic impedance of the transmission line, and the load impedance, this sort of coupling will give a very nice and very flat response over a wide frequency range. But if there is a mismatch, you will see all sorts of variations in the transmitted signal. We can first look at this in the circuit simulator. So I created a basic simulation with 10 nanosecond long coupled transmission lines in which the load is once a open circuit, so one mega ohm, just to prevent any sort of errors, once a short circuit, one milliohm, again to have a defined value, and finally a matched load, in which the final load is matched to the signal source's 50 ohms. Now in this first set of experiments, the coupled transmission line is at a different impedance compared to either the signal source or the load. So we have a 100 ohm characteristic impedance on the line coupling. Now if we look at how this thing looks, and look at the signal coming from the signal source, so on the open load, matched load and short circuited load, and we just zoom in a bit to make things a bit more clear. So we can see the quarter wavelength 25 megahertz and half wavelength 50 megahertz effect. So at 50 megahertz, our match load shows a signal of minus 6 dB. So the load is being matched to the signal source. The open load is showing 0 dB. It's not having any effect on the signal source. And while the shorted load has a minimum response, and then at the quarter wavelength frequency, we are seeing an inversion. The short circuit is being seen as an open circuit, the open circuit is being seen as a short circuit, and while the 50 ohm impedance is being inverted. Now, when everything is matched on the other hand, so the signal source is matched to the transmission line's characteristic impedance, and that is matched to the final load, we see an ideal behavior over the entire frequency range. We see an ideal coupling even at low frequency. So this is only occurring because of the ideal nature of the simulated transmission line. This will not be happening in real life. But even after this point, we see that we have a flat response all over. So you can get a perfectly flat coupling when all of the impedances in the system are matched. Otherwise, when the characteristic impedance is different, then you'll get all sorts of variations based on the exact length of coupled transmission line. To test this out, I took about 47 centimeters of twisted wire and connected it to a couple SMA connectors. So one end of the twisted pair goes to the SMA connector, the other to a ground, and the same on the other side. So the two signal lines are at opposing ends. And well, if we measure this thing with the VNA, first of all, I measured the impedance from one side when the second side is left as an open circuit. And we can see that at some frequency, so this is 95 megahertz, the open circuit is being seen as a short circuit. So this is the quarter wavelength frequency of our structure. And if the secondary side is short circuited at approximately the same frequency, so 100 megahertz, the short circuit is being seen as a open circuit. And well, finally, when we measure the S21 for the structure, we can see that at low frequency, not much signal passes through, but we do get a peak at around 112 megahertz. So this peak is at minus 0.46 decibels. And well, the minus three decibel point around this point, so upper and lower frequencies are at 9.19 megahertz and at 179 megahertz. So in this interval, we can get a usable energy transfer through this coupled transmission line structure. So with a magnetic core, you can cover the low frequencies. The magnetically coupled transformer will work up to a certain point when the magnetic material is no longer permeable. And with transmission line coupling, you are limited to relatively high frequencies based on the length of coupled line. So what happens when you combine the two? Well, you get a thing called a transmission line transformer. So even though this principle can be applied in multiple ways, the core idea is that you can create a structure where at low frequencies you rely on magnetic coupling, so the exact minimum operating frequency is determined by the coupled inductance, and then 
At high frequency, the transmission line effect kicks in, so based on the exact length of coupled line. And at this point, the core material doesn't really matter anymore. So to do this, usually you take your transmission line and wrap it around a magnetic core. So you get the best of both worlds. And by doing this, you can create a very wide frequency transformer or balen. To highlight the effect, I took the same type of core that we tested before and wound the same number of turns, so approximately 19. But this time, the primary and secondary windings are twisted together, so to form a coupled transmission line. And well, if we measure this thing using the DNA, well, we get a very nice, very flat and very wide band response. So it starts even before 100 kHz to have a pretty decent coupling, and it goes up into the 100 MHz range. So our peak of about minus 0 0.1 is at 250 kilohertz. And well, minus three decibels in reference to this is at 143 megahertz. Now this graph becomes even nicer when we overlap our previous two measurements. So in gray, we have the transformer coupling effect by itself. So when we had the same number of turns, but they were completely separated. In red, we have the transmission line coupling where we had the same length of coupled transmission lines. And while in green, we have the two effects overlapped. So the final transformer, which is taking advantage of both of these phenomenon. So the complete structure takes advantage at low frequencies of the magnetic coupling and at high frequencies of the transmission line coupling, yielding the best of both worlds. Now, before ending things for today, I would just like to point out a few constructive hints that I found. So one of the problems with my first transformer is the proximity of the turns to the actual core or well the lack of it. So there's quite a bit of distance in between the wire and the core. And ideally you want the turns touching the magnetic core to minimize the leakage flux. Now when I built the structure I was not really paying attention too much and well it's quite a bit of extra effort to actually minimize this distance between the turns and the core in practice. Now coming to the twisted pair transformer, this suffers from the same problem, there's quite a bit of distance in between the core and the wires, but even if there wouldn't be this distance, half of the turns would still be at one wire thickness away from the core. So because of the twisting, you always have half of the winding at a certain distance from the core. So to get the best out of magnetic coupling, you want to have the turns running in parallel as a transmission line. And if they're not twisted, they can always lie flat on the core. So like this thing on the right. Now it's harder to build it this way, but if it's practically achievable, this sort of construction should yield the best results. Since by minimizing the distance to the core, you can get the best out of the magnetic coupling aspect. So when you need an energy transfer element that can work over a very wide frequency range, although the typical transformer comes to mind, this component is quite limited as frequency increases. Transmission line coupling can work pretty well at high frequencies, but combining the two can yield a structure that takes advantage of both operating principles. So that is why the component from the beginning has a useful range spanning from 5 MHz to 3 GHz. So this thing is an example of a transmission line transformer. You have all sorts of other implementations, depending on the exact needs that you have. And with that said, hope you got some useful information to this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching, make sure to subscribe to get updated on my videos, and see you next time. Bye bye.